Welcome to your third video in your Chapter 12 video lecture series where we're going to discuss Section 12.3 on the function of nervous tissue. And before we did that, I wanted to discuss some of the functions of the nervous system. First, it's going to assist us in maintaining homeostasis by regulating and coordinating the physiology within our body. The second function is that it'll receive sensory input. We've talked about this before. We get to monitor internal and external stimuli. So external would be, you know, putting your hand on a hot stove would be external stimuli coming in. Something internal would be like you feeling like you have a stomach ache. And then number three, we're going to integrate the information. So our brain and spinal cord process sensory input and will initiate responses. Fourth, we will be able to control our muscles and glands. And fifth, we will be able to establish and maintain mental activity. So being conscious, being able to think, having memory and emotions. Now let's get into sensation integration and response. The first thing I wanna draw your attention to is a specific kind of receptor known as a thermoreceptor. This is gonna be a sensory receptor that is sensitive to, you may have guessed it, temperature and this will be found in our skin. So your book has this example laid out for you. I'm gonna walk through it just once, but we're gonna highlight specific portions of this throughout this section. So here in our finger, we are going to have the sensory endings in our skin. So this is our thermoreceptor that is sensing the water. So from that area, we are going to have the temperature, let's say it's I don't know, really hot, go through our sensory neuron. So that information is continuing through an action potential through this sensory axon of our sensory neuron. It does have a little cell body here in what's known as a dorsal root ganglion. And then it continues through the spinal cord and will make its way up toward the brain. So here in the brain, it's going to synapse with an interneuron just to help convey that information. And eventually it'll make its way toward a very important structure in the brain known as the thalamus. Now the thalamus is like this special sensory relay center. So any sensory information that comes in here, whether it's pain, hot, cold, um, pressure, it's gonna stop in here and then send it out the proper path. So we're gonna synapse with another neuron in this case, and that will go over to a sensory area in the cerebral cortex, where we can have conscious thought take place about what this information means. Now let's say in our brain, we have that conscious thought that, hey, this water is really hot. So next what's gonna happen is we go over to our motor cortex here and we are gonna use an upper motor neuron from this cortex to send a command. So an action potential is gonna go through this upper motor neuron and then through the spinal cord until it reaches the proper level and it'll synapse with a lower uh, motor neuron and send it out. So let's say, we're going out um, and headed toward the hand. So we are headed down the forearm and into the hand. And here we're gonna have a neuromuscular junction. We are gonna make contact with skeletal muscles in order to contract them and pull it away, put our, pull our hand away. So that was a long path, right? Now we're gonna start talking about some of the physiology that takes place regarding those um, pathways. So the first thing we need to discuss are graded, excuse me, potentials. And these are gonna result from ligands binding to receptors. And by ligands, they can be things like neurotransmitters. They could be due to changes in charge across membranes through mechanical stimulation. So maybe we're feeling a vibration or pressure. They can be felt through temperature changes like we felt with the hot water on our hand or spontaneous changes in permeability. So what do we mean by that term graded and graded potentials? 
It means that the magnitude is going to vary from small to large depending on the stimulus strength or the frequency. So here we can see successive stronger stimuli of short duration. So we've got one stimuli here, another one here, another one here as time goes on. And then we can also have these potentials summate or add to another. So think of that word sum, which means add, right? So we can have the stimuli take place really close together and that is going to build upon the previous potential. So for instance, up here, we get a little bit of a potential, but then it goes back down. Again, up and down. But here, because the frequency is so quick back to back, we are going to be able to not allow that action potential, or sorry, that potential to go back down and let's say, I was saying relax, so to go back down, and the term I should use is repolarize, but instead we are going to continue to build upon that potential so that we can get to a more positive level. So um, these graded potentials are going to spread over the plasma membrane of our nerve cell in a decremental fashion and we're gonna rapidly decrease in magnitude as they spread over the surface of this plasma membrane. And that can cause a generation of action potentials. What are action potentials? This is going to have a depolarization phase followed by a repolarization phase. So what I mean by that is when our neuron cell is at rest at negative 70 millivolts, we will get a stimulus or something that causes the inside of that cell to become more positive. And if we're able to reach that threshold, that's when we get depolarization to take place, meaning that we are gonna make the inside of the cell more positive. Whereas when we reach the height of that action potential, then we are going to get repolarization taking place, which makes the cell more negative. And sometimes we get what's called an after potential or a hyperpolarization in which the cell is trying to get back to its resting membrane potential, but it kind of overshoots it and we become, we become really negative, like let's say negative 85 or negative 90. But eventually we have a uh, sodium potassium pump that kind of puts the ions in the right place and that brings us back to a resting membrane potential. So we will have some permeability changes take place that cause those graded potentials we just described in order to get this depolarization to take place. Now we have this threshold set in place in order to fit our all or none principle, or really our threshold creates this all or none principle, because no matter how strong the stimulus, as long as it is greater than the threshold, then we are going to get all. We are gonna get this action potential to go through. But if we are less than that threshold, then we get none. That action potential is not gonna take place at all. And I wanted to show you this illustration of an action potential moving through. So action potentials in the communicating neuron will stimulate this neuron through graded potentials. We'll get a change in permeability that starts to make the inside of the cell more positive, which eventually will summate at the trigger zone. So once the action potential at that triggered zone begins, action potentials are going to propagate, meaning it's going to travel down the axon toward the axon terminal here. And our action potentials will result in communicating with its target organ, whether that's another neuron or it could be a muscle or a gland. And here is just a quick illustration to show you propagation. We can see here that the inside of the cell is positive. And as the inside here is receiving positive ions, that is going to start to kind of diffuse into the next area. So what happens is this next area, which is pictured down here, will become positive and have an action potential whereas the back portion here is going through repolarization or hyperpolarization, or we can also call that an after potential. And in this way, we can always make sure that 
the propagation of an action potential is moving toward the axon terminal. So once we get that action potential toward the end of a neuron, we can have a synapse take, take place at the junction between two cells. So again, this could be between a neuron and another neuron, or it could be between a neuron and a muscle cell or a gland. And this is where we are getting that action potential to be sent to another cell. And so we can talk about this, if it's two neurons, as being a presynaptic neuron, which is sending that action potential to the next uh, neuron, which we are going to call the postsynaptic neuron or postsynaptic cell. And here are the components that are going to allow for synapse to take place. First, we have our presynaptic terminal. The space here is called the synaptic cleft. And then the receiving neuron here is going to be the postsynaptic membrane. Or if it's a muscle cell or gland, it's going to be a postsynaptic membrane as well. So at this point, neurotransmitters are going to be released by action potential in this presynaptic terminal. And in these synaptic vesicles, we will have the um, neurotransmitters. And once the action potential reaches this terminal, it'll cause these voltage-gated calcium channels to open. Calcium will move in, bind to the synaptic vesicles, and cause these synaptic vesicles to exocytose, meaning release those neurotransmitters to move across the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So in this case, it could be, let's say, acetylcholine binding to their acetylcholine receptors that will open its channel, allowing sodium to move through. And if enough sodium moves through this postsynaptic cell, then we are going to be able to reach threshold and it fires another action potential or nerve impulse through um, that nerve or cell. So we've kind of talked about the physiological processes that are taking place through the sensory nerve. And then we went up, we synapsed over here with another interneuron that took it over to our thalamus. And we said our thalamus is serving as a sensory relay station and here, information can be sent to that cerebral cortex to give us conscious perception of the water temperature. This information, like we said, is processed here, and we think about the temperature, the sensory stimuli. Maybe it doesn't fit our emotional state and memories. Maybe that warm water makes us feel like a baby getting bathed and makes us all happy. And then we come up with a plan. Sorry about that for a plan as to what to do next. So in our cerebral cortex, we're gonna send a command to our muscles. So now we're gonna go through our motor nerves and eventually to our skeletal muscles here. So we do that through an upper motor neuron, and this is gonna be found in what's called the pre-central gyrus of our frontal cortex. So in this area, we, uh, we also can call this a motor cortex. It's where all of our motor neurons are going to begin so that we can extend it on down through the spinal cord to the proper region, whether that's for the upper limb or the lower limb, and eventually synapse in the spinal cord at the correct level to uh, send that signal through a lower, lower motor neuron. And that'll travel through the body to the specific muscle in order to cause contraction. Now for a career connection of a neurophysiologist. Neurophysiologists are going to study neurophysiology, basically how the nervous system works, and they serve as research scientists. So in order to do this, they go to college and get a bachelor's degree, go to graduate school, and typically they will get their PhD in order to do this type of research. And then they will do some postdoctoral research and hope for an academic research position at a university. And at the university, the research, they're gonna establish their own research career.